welcome two revolutions. Usually revolutions are not something you welcome people to or at, for, because revolutions by nature, by name, is, are violent and they change things from status quo to something else that most probably nobody knows what will happen after. It has been said that the time of a revolution is the worst time, it is worse than before, because before you know what was, and worse than the, what will come because you don't know the future. So the time of a, re of a revolution is really a challenging time to be at. But guess what? Every morning we wake up to a revolution. Things happen so fast in our world today. Politically, economically, technologically, uh, you name it. Things change so fast. And the rate of change in our generation is amazing. There is a course called Technology and Society. And people just study this, what technology is doing to us and how are we uh, creating technology as well. I have another course called Global Technology to talk about the same thing uh, globally and so forth. But why are we talking about this today? We came here for carrots. Don't forget your carrot, did you? Do you? Let me welcome you to this session of the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Science and Technology. And as we are approaching the end of the symposium, you can imagine we ran almost out of the booklets. So uh, every session I encourage people to take two copies. Maybe I made a mistake to do that. But I told them take one for you or your friend and one for your grandkids. Because I'm sure you'll come 50 years ago, uh, 50 years ahead in a homecoming one time and say, hey, I was part of the first science and technology symposium, so it will be a collectible something. Revolutions in science and technology paradigms is the title or the theme of this. We were blessed with 50 speakers, almost 50 speakers in different topics. And if you missed any of these, we are working on putting everything online. It, uh, all sessions were taped, videotaped, thanks to CATS, and I want you please to give CATS a hand. They, uh, thank you, they made a wonderful job uh, as a team uh, and CATS support this symposium to videotape everything. Also, we took pictures and we'll take pictures today also. All will be online uh, for people to uh, enjoy and benefit for years to come. So if you missed any of the uh, sessions here, you will see it, I hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, I'm hoping by the end of February or something. Those of you who work with putting uh, websites, or web pages or something, know how uh, time consuming and intensive this is. And again, it is uh, teamwork to do that. Um, I'm also putting online the program itself, so if you couldn't have a hard copy of this, you can look at it online if you want to reprint it. It's not copyrighted, it's yours. So yours uh, to uh, print out of it and share it with others as well. Uh, Scott Ronspies is the person who gave us the grand finale of uh, the closing session in the, uh, the first symposium about Egypt. And guess what? He got his students engaged in designing dances and doing amazing acrobatic things to the extent we had to do it in the gym. If some of you have been into that, maybe some of you uh, attended this. And uh, he was competing with himself, and he succeeded. He beat himself the following year in ancient Greece. So that was last year. This year, he said that, I'll do carrots. What are you going to do with carrots? Thanks. Would you please join me in welcoming Scott Ronspies? Thanks. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, as you know, my name is Dr. Ronspies, and I'm in the KSS department. And definitely tonight, we're going to have you rocking and rolling because we're going to get you interacting right away. So before we get started, go ahead and turn to the people next to you, introduce yourself, because you're going to be interacting here shortly. So please do that. I mean, for those of you that know me or for those of you that have had class with me, you know that 
you're not just going to sit in the desk and do nothing. You're going to be highly engaged in the process because that's what makes it fun. That's what makes learning exciting. So with that said, I wanted to welcome you to my presentation along with some of my graduate students in my KSS 5000 Research Methods course. So these are graduate students that are conducting research for the first time. Maybe this is something ongoing. This might be something for a thesis. So they are going to provide their expertise as well. So as you can see by the crazy title up there, don't forget to eat your carrots, conquering the myths in physical education. All right, we're going to be looking at physical education, exercise science, health and wellness. Because let's be honest, every single one of you in here, including myself, is striving for one thing, and that is to always be well. Wellness is a state of being free of disease, illness, etc. I mean, don't we all long for that? Nobody wants to be sick and laying in bed in your apartment all day, unless you've got a hard class coming up and you want to skip it, right? So you want to be healthy, and being healthy is extremely important in just how you function each day. So with that said, let's go ahead and get rocking and rolling here because, like I said, we're going to be interacting shortly, and then I'm going to pass it on to the experts, and they're going to talk about eight different topics. Now, folks, as you know, in the health, the allied health science world, there is a million things that are influenced by science and technology. From what we eat, to the way we exercise, to the way we condition the body, the way we play sports, the way we do intramurals, all of that is affected by research. We're just going to give you a snapshot of a few things tonight, so we could never do it all justice. So, with that said, just like Wafiq said, I hope you ate some carrots or you ate something healthy because we're going to get you going right away. All right, here we go. Take a look at some of these machines. Now, for some of us young bucks in here, we've never seen these before. But folks, I can honestly remember as a little kid going into my grandma's basement and she had one of those shake machines. Does that look familiar to some of you? Absolutely. That was a way that... At that time, the experts thought that if you just got into this belt and then just, I can remember my sister and I going down there and turning it on, it'd shake you all crazy. And they really thought that that was a way to train the body. That was the hot stuff. That was the rec center back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And as you can see, there's some other equipment there. I mean, you can start to see how it starts to look like some of our modern technology now that we have at the rec center, at the body club, et cetera, et cetera. You can start to see the shapings of, a, of an exercise bike. You've got a guy working on his posture over there on some contraption that somebody made. Okay? So let's just take a little tour of history and look at just a snapshot of some of the machines that were available. I mean, geez, can you imagine going to the rec center, students, and looking like that guy on the left? I mean, that'd be a great way to attract the opposite sex, wouldn't it, having that strapped to your head? It's embarrassing enough sometimes just going to exercise. Can you imagine those kinds of machines? Just look at them. They almost look barbaric. But, folks, that's the start of what we know today, elliptical machines, uh, exercise machines, free weights, Pilates, yoga, combat training. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Now you start to see as we get into the 70s and the 80s, kind of the, year, the years when I was born in the mid-70s, now you start to see this premise of universal machines. For those of you that played any college sports in those days in the 70s, this was, this was the hot ticket to exercise the body. You start to see the exercise bikes, and we know. I mean, just look at the picture of what that represents. If you work out, you're going to look sexy. All right? I don't know how sexy that looks nowadays, but that was kind of the premise behind their machines that they developed. Now you start to get into the, oh, man, look at those tights on the right. Now you start to get into the 80s. 
You've got, you've got guys like Jack LaLanne. Now we're starting to understand that eh, this free weight stuff kind of works. This aerobics. Remember, remember back in the day when they used to always do step aerobics? They'd get up on the steps, those plastic steps, and they had all kinds of routines. Folks, that was the start of, 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 of some of the programs that we offer over at the rec center now today. We just have fancier names for it like P90X and so forth. This is where it all started, folks, in our, in our history of, of wellness. And it's research that has gotten us. It's science and technology that have gotten us here. Now, this probably looks a little more common to some of you. All right? You start to see elliptical machines, body balls, exercise balls, ellipticals, treadmills, free weights, machines. Now you're starting to see how we've evolved through science and technology because research has shown us that, hey, there are specific correct ways to train the body to maximize its performance for whatever that is, for whatever age or objective you have. So as we know, you go to the rec center, you go to a gym, you talk to your friends, you talk to your girlfriends on the phone, you talk to your buddies. There's myths being spread all over the place. Hey, did you hear about this? If you, if you eat six eggs before you lift weights, you'll get all this muscle. Well, if you drink a half a pound of powdered creatine, you're going to do this. All these myths are available to our ears, and a lot of them just aren't true. A lot of them are spread by just word of mouth. A lot of them are spread by media, whether that's the newspaper, internet, television. And we know a lot of them are driven by money. That's what drives that six, seven billion dollar business. And we know, unfortunately, that a lot of the information is inaccurate. It's just not true. I mean, think about it, folks. If exercise was that easy, why aren't all of us in shape then? Why, why do we have such an obesity problem then if working out is so easy? It's not. It's a very complex problem because you're working with the most complex machine that not even science and technology can create, and that's the body. That's what's beautiful about science and technology is we got all this fancy stuff, but we may never quite understand this because we didn't make this. We make the bod pod to calculate your body composition. We make the hydrostatic tank that we dunk you in to see what your body fat is. We make the machines up here. But guess what? We don't make this one. It's already made for us by something. Okay? So that's what makes all these myths so appealing sometimes. But folks, you gotta know what you're you gotta know what you're looking at. And that's the purpose of tonight. So you gotta know your stuff. I mean, how many of you have ever met that person? They think they know everything, they don't know peanuts. You talk to them and they just they really don't know anything. But boy, you'd think they do if you talk to them. You got to be a critical consumer of your environment. You got to know what information is valuable. And that's why we have science and technology and research in our field. Is because that's what drives the decisions, the choices, the opportunities we have. So that's what I want you to do when you leave tonight. I want you to really focus on knowing the most reputable information out there. Because you only get one of these. That's it. You got to take care of it while it's here because you don't get a second try. And that's where we come in with the science and the technology and the focus of this symposium. All right? Oh, man, I hope you're not sleeping now because if you are, you better wake up because it's going to get crazy in here now fast. All right? Now, we got a little challenge for you. Okay? So you take a look at this slide. Once you get past all the animation, you see some words. But we've got something that nobody else has done in this symposium yet. We have our very own KSS Mythbusters Challenge. All right? That's why I asked each of you to sit by somebody. You can't challenge something just by yourself in a presentation with me. You're going to be interacting now. So I'm going to throw up some things that you hear in the media from friends, etc., etc. And now you're going to banter back and forth and say, should we look at that as fact or should we bust that and say, yeah, that's a myth, that's not true. So 
turn to your partner. Give them a high five quick. All right? Because now we're going to rock and roll. Here is your first assignment. Number one. How'd they get a picture of me there? Okay? That's when I had longer hair. At, this was before a PhD. Okay? All right. What I'll do is I will show the thing. You're going to banter for about 30 seconds, so we don't want to do it all night. Okay? And then we're going to see, is this a fact or is it going to be busted? So I should hear lots of interaction about the topics. All right? So, there it is. Read it, and now talk amongst your table. I'll give you about 30 to 45 seconds a session. Go. If some of the people in the front row don't know this question, it's going to be really bad because they're master students in this. Okay. Is the ban I don't see any punches thrown, so it looks like we've come to an agreement. Now, let's take a look. One, in general, does weight training make females bulky and gain weight? So in general, anybody got any thoughts? Does just typically, are you going to see a female go to the rec center or the gym and lift weights and just all of a sudden develop this gargantuan amount of muscle mass? Any thoughts? Just, you don't have to raise your hand, just blurt them out. No. no. Why? Is anybody, it, I don't know. Maybe it's true. I don't know. I, I disagree. Kids up front, be quiet. Don't say nothing. Except for you two. You can talk. These for us can't because they know the answers. So, what do you think? Ah, so maybe it has something to do with those two beautiful junior high terms, estrogen and testosterone. Okay, if you don't know what those two hormones look like, go to a middle school and you will soon see. I don't know, I think it's true. I, 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 I train with a lot of women like this that are huge back home in Nebraska. I train with the world's, my friend back home in Omaha is the world's strongest woman. She looks just like that. I think it's true. I don't know. Well, let's find out. Okay. Number one is busted. You are correct back there. What's your name? Kelsey. Kelsey. You're right. There's that one beautiful hormone in a woman's body called estrogen. Now, women have testosterone too, just not in the amounts that men do. Typically, this is a myth. Women, you're not going to get overly large lifting weights. Now, what will, though, happen? Will you gain some weight? Yes, because muscle weighs more than fat, but that's good weight, okay? But typically, we will bust this myth, all right? So that's how it works, all right? Let's go to number two, all right. Banter back and forth for 45 seconds. Go. Okay, what do you think? Anybody got any thoughts? Now let's look, at the, let, let's look at this now, don't let it fool you. Proper weight training techniques will make you lose flexibility. What do you think, folks? Any thoughts? Yes or no? Okay, so maybe there's a trigger word in there. But hey, I got this buddy back home that is so muscle bound. I mean, he looks like he was sculpted out of a, a stone. He came and raised his arms above his head. But look at the way the question is worded. Will proper weight training techniques really in general make you lose flexibility? What do you think? Yes or no? No. Anybody think? Yeah, it does. You're more than welcome to banter with us professionally. 
We would love to hear you. Well, let's look. Dun, dun, dun. Busted. Okay? No. Typically, if you are lifting through a full range of motion, now, folks, that does it. This is not full range of motion doing bicep curls. This is not full range squatting. <laughs> okay? How many of you have seen this or done this? Okay? You are not getting the benefits there. Now, you're right. If you lift incorrect technique, it can cause some issues. But if you're doing things correctly, typically it actually helps increase flexibility. So that is busted. Number three, here we go. Oh, it just gets better and better. How do they get a picture of me on the treadmill? Because it's not me. All right, there it is. Running on a treadmill puts less stress. Oh, I can't wait for this one. 45 seconds, go. Be careful on this one is all I got to say. Twenty seconds. Don't think too long. Could trick you. Okay. I mean, you've all heard the analogy. All right, got to get up. Let's go pound the pavement. I hate running. Let's go pound the pavement. Does running on a treadmill put less stress on your knees than running on pavement or cement, let's say? Ooh, I can't wait to hear this one. What are your thoughts? Yes. Okay. Okay. So there we've got somebody that says, hey, I, I kind of feel that personally. Now, we don't know if that's psychological or not. We're going to find out in a second. Anybody else care to banter professionally? Remember, it's okay to argue opinions and points. But it's never okay to argue with people. Anybody want to banter? No one? Scared? I would be too. Okay. Any thoughts? This is hard, folks. This, this is not an easy one. You think so? Man, I can't wait. What are you thinking? Oh man, I'm almost afraid to click the button for the for the abuse I'm going to take here shortly. But in all actuality, folks, this number three is busted. It does not matter, folks, typically what the surface is you're running on. It's the force generated by your body weight that causes your joints to suffer. Now, some may disagree with that, and I would, I would agree with you too. Maybe running on a treadmill is less stress, but typically the researchers from their studies have shown and told us that typically... It's not necessarily what you're running on. It's the force of your body weight on the joints that causes them to be sore or not. True. That's right. See, there's a guy that's always thinking back there. And remember, folks, these are just, these are just assumptions or speculations that we're deriving from the research. It doesn't mean it's always fact. Like the lady back there, what was your first name again? I mean, you swear by the fact that, hey, I like running on a treadmill better. It just makes my joints feel better. Absolutely agree with you 100%. All right? So that's a toughie. That one is not easy. So let's see what number four brings us. Ooh, I can't wait to go back home to Nebraska to do that. And there it is. Eating a large carbohydrate meal about 30 minutes before you exercise will make you tired midway through the session. Talk about it for 45 seconds at your table. Think carefully.
There's definitely a little story behind this one. What do you think? So if I eat this big carbohydrate meal, mashed potatoes, gravy, bread, turkey, a typical Thanksgiving meal, how are you going to feel if you go work out afterwards? Are you going to be tired midway through the workout typically or nah, it's fine, just do it? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Yes. Could be. We'll find out in a second. Maybe it's psych psychological. Maybe not. Maybe there is something physiological going on. Okay. What do you notice all the men typically do after a Thanksgiving dinner? Oh, they don't, do, they don't help with dishes, do they, it seems like. Well, let's look. This is a fact, okay? When you eat a large carbohydrate meal, folks, where does a majority of your blood go to after the meal? To your gut. It goes to your gut to digest food. That's its job. That's why when you see in high schools, typically, some of the classes that kids will struggle with the most are those typically right after lunch because they just can't help it. They're tired, they're lethargic, they're trying to stay awake. Okay, They just physically can't because the blood is rushing to the gut to digest food. So that is actually a fact. Oh man, this is getting good. Number five, how'd they get a picture of me on the right? If you stop exercising, your muscles will turn to fat. 45 seconds, go. I bet this happens to all of us. If you quit working out, all that big monstrous muscle tissue just gets fat. Any thoughts? Anybody? Don't be afraid to talk. Are you sure? How do you know? He just knows. That's confidence. That's what I like. He's not speculating. He knows. Who else wants to professionally disagree with this gentleman? I do. I bet it's true. I don't have a rationale. It's just true. I'm... Oh, man, this guy might know what he's talking about. Something with protein, maybe. Well, let's find out. Busted. Folks, muscle tissue cannot turn to fat tissue or vice versa. It's impossible. You can't take gold and make it into silver. You just cannot do that. It is impossible. Muscle tissue does not turn into fat tissue. This is a myth. But how many times do you hear people say that working out? Oh, I've gotten flabby. I haven't worked out in like six months. I'm getting fat. Really, in all actuality, it's probably something psychological telling them, well, I haven't been eating well either. I haven't been exercising. And hence, I'm starting to maybe see some of my results go to the wayside. But folks, muscles do not turn to fat or vice versa. That is impossible. Okay? So don't believe that when you hear that at the, at the place that you work out. All right, here we go. It just gets better and better. What's that? We all have one. If you don't know this one, leave. Okay? If you're not sure on that, I mean, we shouldn't even have to banter this, should we? Just read it. I mean, if you, if you aren't sure, you clearly are lost. Okay? That's a fact. Exercise does help prevent various types of disease. Now, folks, it's no guarantee. It's no guarantee. Folks, I was highly active my whole life. But if you look on the right side of my body, your left sides, I'm guessing, you'll see something on my waistline that some of you may not have, that I have now for life. And that's diabetes. I worked out all the time. I was the biggest stud in high school. I trained all through college, okay? I was highly fit. 
very strong, strong as an ox. Well, what happened to me? Well, only, only Mother Nature knows that. But typically, exercise is good for us, folks. I, I, th I don't think we can disagree with that, can we? It's good for our bodies. It's a machine. You have to work it. All right? Ooh, number seven. I bet you've heard this one before. Man, you got to do 100 crunches a day to get that six-pack to show. Talk about it in your little group for 45 seconds. Go. I'll guarantee you've heard this. And here's what's ironic. We all have a six-pack. So we all have a 12-pack. Now, folks, not the one in your fridge at your apartment, okay? That's called a keg, all right? But I'll guarantee you've heard this. Man, you got to bang out more, you gotta bang out more crunches. You got to be like Herschel Walker. You got to do like 500 a day. And then you'll get that six-pack to pop out, and then all the girls are going to love you. What do you think, folks? Fact or fiction or busted? What do you think? Don't be shy. I think mine are covered with fat. I think mine are covered with fat. I bet you 99% of the world can probably say that about too. Any other thoughts? Oh, I heard somebody. Anybody? Busted. Folks, you can do crunches till you're blue in the face. But if you have no form of cardiovascular activity or some kind of aerobic activity to burn the fat away, they'll never be seen. Okay? We all have ab muscles. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do what? You wouldn't even be able to stand up and move. You would just crumble apart. You would just fall down into a blob. You have those muscles that hold you up. If you all feel right here, you've all, we've all got them. They're just covered by, unfortunately, too much subcutaneous fat. And a lot of that is attributed just to our American lifestyle. Okay? But hey, be, be positive when you leave here. You all have ab muscles, so be happy. All right? I didn't mean to just, I didn't, I, I didn't mean to make you feel bad. Oh, I bet some of us have been to somebody like that before. If I'm not, oh man, you hear this all the time, especially with men. This is a real macho statement. Man, if you're not sore the next day, I didn't work out hard enough. What do you think? Do we even need to banter that? I mean, that just almost sounds barbaric. But I can remember coaches in the 90s telling us this stuff in high school. Well, if you're not sore, guys, the next day, you got to up it up. You got to get going. I mean, that is such a barbaric mentality. That's clearly a coach that does not understand research and science. That's somebody that still tells his athletes or hers, hey, put extra salt on your fries during two-a-days. They just, folks, they don't, they're just not, they're not, they shouldn't be working with kids. I know. Uh, well, and that's why half of them are failing my class, so... Um, <laughs> Busted! Okay? Folks, that's not true. You don't have to be dead dog sore. Now, how come when you first start training, though, that next day you're like, ugh, you, know, you can't even move for like three days? Well, that's called something totally different, delayed onset muscle soreness. But, folks, you don't have to be crippled to have a good workout. That's not the point. That's a very, that's a very unscientific statement. That's somebody who reads Muscle and Fitness magazine versus somebody who reads Academia and those types of manuscripts. Okay? That's not true. Ooh, gentlemen especially, okay, and ladies too. This is probably more towards the male population. I'll bet you've been told this. If you eat higher amounts of protein than recommended, you'll get them big muscles. I want you to banter this one. Go. I'll guarantee you if I go over to the stadium at the weight room, I'll bet you I'll see tons of protein drinks over there. I know I will, because I've been over there. 
I'll bet you all the coaches in the country tell, I mean, when you watch ESPN, you see these big fancy universities like Oregon, they got these just coolers full of supplements for the athletes. Fifteen billion dollar business a year. I wish those zeros were in my checking account. Okay, look at the way that it's worded. There's no argument. Protein is good for the body. It helps repair tissue. Fact. No argument. You'll never win. But look how that's worded. Well, I'll just take an extra scoop than what's recommended. Can't hurt. What do you think, folks? Fact or busted? You'd hope. But we know that the FDA doesn't even control supplements what's on the package. You could put anything in there and you'd never know what it is. But a lot of us common sense would tell us that more is always not better unless it's zeros in your checking account after a number. Preferably not a zero. Okay? It's good to have a one or higher above that number. Okay? That's busted, folks. Folks, extra protein is extremely dangerous for your body. It can actually pull fluid out of your cells. It can actually dehydrate you. And it can cause havoc on what two organs? There's a pair of them. What are they called? Kidneys. They, yes, they are. It's extremely dangerous. It can actually pull calcium out of bone if you take it in excess. How many of you have taken excess protein before? What happens to you shortly after? Now folks, it's human, we all do this, so it's not, it's not embarrassing. You will become extremely thirsty, and when you go to the bathroom, number two, it is a unique experience because it is extremely different in texture, okay? Too much protein is not good. So you eat six protein bars thinking, well, that should be extra muscle. No. No, it's not good for you. That's busted. All right? Hey, look at that little guy. A person will see rapid strength gains. The first six, So this is somebody who's fresh. They've never probably exercised much, and they go to the gym and some phenomenon happens. I don't know what the phenomenon is. We'll talk about it in a second. Will a person see rapid gains in the first six weeks of their exercise regimen? Talk about that in your group. Something does happen. I'm no expert, but I got an idea. What do you think? Who thinks that's a fact? Raise your hand. Fact. Fact. Fiction. Busted. What do you think? A any thoughts as to why or why not? Anybody? Go. You. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe he's wrong. I don't know. We're going to find out. Gosh, I, was, I started working out the other day again, and like, geez, I had these like incredible gains in my lifts. Yes. Good. Your body's getting more consistent with the results, more consistent with the machines or the free weights. <laughs> Folks, this in all actuality is a fact, okay? You're going to see rapid gains, but in all actuality, they're not typically muscle hypertrophy. What's happening is you are recruiting more motor neurons in the muscles. There's more activation. But in all actuality, you're not really getting really any stronger yet. That comes in time. But right away, you ever notice that? You're like, Gosh, I could do like 10 reps on that machine when I started. Now I can do like 15. It's only been like a week or two. That's because your body is accommodating to this new stimulus. But here after about 12 weeks or so, you'll start to then gain muscle. But there is some kind of a, 
there is some kind of a, of a gain, okay? Some would argue maybe it's not a strength gain, but there's some kind of gain happening. And then after about that 12 weeks, then you start to actually, your muscles start to grow, all right? Ooh, look at that. That's cool. A well-balanced diet isn't enough. I got to supplement. I got to go to GNC and give those guys and girls more money because they just don't make enough. What do you think about this one, anybody? You can banter or just say it out loud. What do you think? I'm getting tired of this well-balanced diet stuff. I'm not seeing any improvement. I better, I better take some vitamins and minerals and supplements. What does common sense tell you here if you just look at this slide? What does it tell you? Those of you who have taken nutrition courses, etc. Okay, yeah, possibly. Well, let's look first and then we'll talk. Okay? Folks, you can, for the most part, get everything you need from a well-balanced diet. There really is no need for supplementation. Now, if you're iron deficient or you're deficient in something, you might need a supplement from, from a doctor prescription. But typically, you can get everything you need from, a, from eating well. Now, if you're busting out hamburgers every day and fried food, it's going to be a problem, obviously. But in general, a good, well-balanced diet can give you everything you need. Because, folks, your body can only use so much of the, of the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins, the vitamins, etc. And then after that, what happens to them if your body's used enough of it? It just excretes it. It has to. Okay? So don't be fooled by all that supplementation talk. Be a reputable and critical consumer of your environment. You got to lift machines, folks. That's the only way to go is what this is saying. Machines are a safer way to exercise because you're doing it right all the time. What do you think? I see a lot of heads moving in one direction. This is tricky. This is tricky. You got to look at the wording. Busted. What's the biggest problem with machines? Yes, they are safe. Yes, they are helpful to novice lifters. Yes, they are helpful to people that are experienced lifters. It gives them a different, different range of motion, different movement. But folks, what must you know in order for that machine to work for you correctly? How to use it? And most importantly, how to adjust it to match your body size. Have you ever noticed on some of them, like over at the rec, they've got little pins you can pull, and then you can line it up with your knee joint. If it's not aligned to your bodily needs, it's not working as efficient as it can for you. So that's actually a myth. It's got to be adjusted to your body. You can see there the young lady training. See that yellow bar on that machine? That's a way she can maybe adjust the height of the seat. She can adjust the angle that her body's at. If the machine is not in good mechanical order for your body, it won't work as efficient. And folks, let's be honest. What are most people at the gym going to do? Are they going to raise their hand and say, help me, Mr. or Mrs. Trainer? What are they going to do? They're just going to try to just figure it out on their own, and it's going to be a negative experience. Hence, we won't see them back after January when the new year's done, okay? When the, when the influx of clientele screams at a local gym. And then two months later, they disappear, okay? And this is one of the reasons. Last one, if I'm not mistaken, okay? Oh, I bet you heard this from them old school coaches in high school or maybe a trainer, before an exercise session, you should stretch before you do some kind of a warm-up like jog or something. Ooh, you better be cautious about answering this one. Any thoughts? 
So should you warm up first and then stretch? Or stretch and then warm up? What are your thoughts? Warm up and then stretch. Anybody argue that? Nah, it doesn't matter. Well, geez, I see everybody at the rec center. What's everybody do when they get to the rec? First thing, they go to that little locker. They put their stuff in there. They look around to see who's at the gym. And then what's the first thing they do with their bodies? Oh, I'm ready. And then they go to what machine first? The men, the bench press. Okay, the women, the cardio machines. Oh, I'm ready to go. Well, folks, that's, it's just not working. It's not working for us, obviously, as a society. So, this number 13 is busted. This is false, folks. You should always warm the muscles and joints up first, then stretch them. How many of you were told in high school the opposite? I was, absolutely. Okay, let's stretch first, then we'll warm up. It's, not, it's not, not of much benefit, folks. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay? So what? I didn't give a hoot about what you just talked about for the last 48 minutes. In fact, I didn't even listen to what you said. It was boring. Well, now you should wake up because this is the slide that's the most important. So what? We know science and technology has shaped our discipline. KSS kinesiology and sports studies. It drives everything we do from teaching physical education to athletic training, exercise science, biomechanics, sport management, etc., etc. Everything that we teach you undergrads and graduates is all driven by research. It's an evidence-based program in the KSS department. And I'm guessing it also is in English, physical science, biological science, it's all driven by nanotechnology, this technology, everything is driven by research. From the traffic light that you wait for to turn green, that's all been researched about timing, etc., etc. You think they just randomly put those up at a wire and go, yeah, it looks high enough, let's go with that. That's all been researched. From the shoes you have on, to the cell phone you're using, to the blood pressure pills you take, to the insulin that I have in my pump. That's all been done by research in science and technology. So it keeps us alive. All right? So here's just some of the organizations that I've talked about, the students will talk about here in a second. These are governing bodies in our discipline that drive what we do. Just as all disciplines have their main governing bodies as well. All right? And folks, what I want you to also leave from here is that we're not just dumb jocks in KSS. You oftentimes will see that, oh, what's your major? Oh, physical education. So you get paid to play with balls and you play tag and dodgeball all day. Oh, you're a coach. Must be rough. Must be rough coaching and just kind of wearing wind suits all day and just kind of drawing up plays on the bleachers. That pretty good life, isn't it? But folks, you can clearly see that, and you will clearly see here in the next five minutes from our young experts, that we're clearly not dumb jocks. We base our decisions and our assumptions and our hypotheses and our speculations on science and technology. Everything that we do is based off of that. All right? Take a look at these two short videos, please. Starting defense, place at the table. Looks like Joe's coming around. He should be ready for Saturday. Place at the table. Yeah! Yeah! I think we ought to tell Coach. Hell no, you don't want to know about this. Yeah! Make sure you tell Latimer that the NCAA will be testing on Saturday. Yeah, baby! Starting defense! As my upperclassmen know, we have Pride Night every year before our opening game. Yo, there you go. All right, share. Earth 
Cher, Cher, come in, Cher. <laughs> oh my God. Ms. Stoger, I would just like to say that physical education in this school is a disgrace. I mean, standing in line for 40 minutes is hardly aerobically effective. I doubt I've worked off the calories in a stick of carefree gum. Woo! Well, you certainly exercise your mouth, Cher. Now hit the ball. Ms. Stoger, that machine is just a lawsuit waiting to happen. Thanks for the legal advice. Dion, you're up. Oh, no, Miss Stoger, I have a note from my tennis instructor, and he would prefer it if I didn't expose myself to any training that might derail his teachings. Fine. And How many of you have experienced a physical education experience like that? Waiting in line, hardly any activity, being in sports and just where it's kind of the winner takes all, it's about being the best, winning matters, winning is everything. Okay, the reason I showed those videos, folks, is because I want you to see that we're not just dumb jocks. We're not just dumb people that wear windsuits all day and, and make just decisions on the bleachers. We're, we're intelligent people that drive our teaching, our our exercise regimens, our exercise assessment and prescription, everything by science and technology and research. We're not just dumb jocks. Any questions for me before I turn it over to the real experts of the night? Not me. All right, thanks. Any questions for me before I turn it over to the graduate students? All right. I hope you had fun. That's the most important part of learning is to have some fun while you're doing it too. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the graduate students now. So graduate students, here's the clicker. I will get your PowerPoint set up for you and I will, Marshall, I will run yours as well for your video. And now, like I said before, the eight graduate students are going to talk about a topic for about two minutes each. And once again, folks, they're going to talk about how science and technology has impacted the KSS field, specifically the exercise world. These are graduate students of mine in my KSS research methods class. It's a graduate level class. They'll, they'll start to hate me now as they get to turn their projects in soon, but that's okay, right? I told them there are going to be lots of emotions this semester for them. So they're going to give you some expertise on some topics as well. Once again, just some snapshots of the gazillion ways science and technology impact our field. So, Bridget, you can go ahead, and when I give you the signal, I'll get it set up for you. Like you said, my name is Bridget, and this is Jessica. She's going to be helping me out. I'm going to be talking about polar heart rate monitors today. And who in here has used a heart rate monitor during exercise before, just by a raise of hands? Not many of you. Okay, good. Well, then you guys can listen to this and learn something today, hopefully. Um, I'm going to be talking about the benefits of using heart rate monitors during exercise. A lot of people, uh, when they're exercising, they wonder how much or how how high of intensity they should be using. Well, an easy way to answer that is listen to your body. Listen to yourself during that. Heart rate-based training is a great way, a great indiv individualized way to reach and set personal goals. Although there's a lot of other ways to determine how hard you're working during exercise, such as rating of perceived exertion and uh, breathing rate, but heart rate is the most accurate way to determine how hard you're working. A great, it's also a great way to measure intensity. A lot of people, when they're doing exercise programs, they don't reach their level of fitness that they're wanting to, and they wonder why. It might be because they're not working at the right intensity that they should be working at. So using your heart rate as a measure of intensity is a great way to not undertrain or overtrain. And as far as safety goes, people who have health concerns, um, staying within a certain heart rate range is very important to them during exercise or even during everyday life. And so being able to have a convenient heart, heart rate watch on your wrist instead of having to palpate yourself every few minutes is a really convenient and safe way for them to exercise. 
And we have a polar heart rate monitor up here to show you guys. All of the polar heart rate monitors on the watch, they have a large, easy to read screen that shows the heart rate, your summary of your workout, and your maximum heart rate and your duration of your workout. And it's all within one easy to touch button. All you have to do is hit the button and it scrolls down through all of those so you can set, uh, set it to which one you wanna see during your workout. And how you use it, this is the strap that you will put around your body and you need to wet the plastic part of it and you need to uh, put it, place the plastic part right over your xiphoid process or right in the middle of your chest and you need to adjust the strap so that it fits you, it's not too loose or it's not too tight to your level of comfort during your exercise. And the sensor should be touching your skin. You shouldn't have it over your shirt. It needs to be touching your skin to have the best connection. Um, the watch that she's putting on her wrist the watch that she's putting on her wrist, I mean, it's really as easy as that. You just put it on like you would put on a regular watch, and uh, you, you set it to the program that you're wanting to set it to, whether you're wanting to see how long you've been working out or the heart rate or your maximum heart rate, just that one button that you press, and it connects to the heart rate monitor that is on your chest, which is it's pretty cool if you think about it. It's a lot easier than palpating your wrist with your fingers. But why would you choose Polar? There's so many other different companies that are making heart rate monitors out there. But Polar was actually the inventors of the first heart rate monitor about 30 years ago. And so they really are the experts within this field. And because they've been around so long and they've done so much research and they're continuing to do so much research, it makes it a very valuable and reliable instrument to use. And so overall, uh, using heart rate monitors to help with uh, measuring intensity is not only a good way to stay safe when you're working out, but it's also a great motivation to become physically active. Does anyone have any questions for me today? Anyone? All right. I'm going to pass it over to Jessica. Thank you. All right. So my name is Jessica Wilson. This is Jason. He's going to be my helper during my presentation. And I'm going to talk to you folks a little bit today about BIA monitors. And BIA stands for Bioelectrical Impedance Analysis Monitors. So what does it measure? Well, there are two things that the BIA measures, and that is BMI and body fat percentage. BMI, or body mass index, is a ratio of your weight to your height. It is calculated by taking your weight in kilograms and dividing it by your height in meters squared. And your body fat percentage is your fat mass versus your fat-free mass. So that more so is what people look for when they want to know, like, how much fat they actually have in their body. The fat-free mass would be, like, your bones, your muscle tissue, your organs. And the fat mass is the fat that surrounds that, or the subcutaneous fat. So how it works is whenever we start it, we put in um, some facts about you. So we put in your sex, your age, your height, and your weight. And then once we press start... You have to hold it out in front of you like Jason is demonstrating. And it sends an electrical current through the body. Now these handheld ones would focus on the upper body and it sends an electrical current around and it estimates how much fat versus fat free mass you have. And from that then you get a calculation. On top it says your body fat percentage and on bottom it says your BMI. So there's many different types of BIA monitors, and I'm just going to go through a few of them. The handheld one that Jason has here is the one that we use in the ATP lab over in Lance. So if you ever come get an ATP lab assessment or a fitness assessment, this is the one that we would use on you. There are also standing ones, which you put in the same figures, your height, your weight, your age, and your sex, and you take your shoes off and you stand on them. And on those, the electrical current goes from one foot to the other, and it estimates how much body fat percentage you have. And then there are ones that are both handheld and standing, and these obviously go upper body and lower. And then we also have these in the student rec center next to the counter, that giant thing that you probably never knew what it was. That's actually a BIA monitor. So if you ever want to check your body fat percentage, just go up to it. You take your shoes off, you put in your information, and then it'll estimate your height and your weight, and it'll tell you about how much body fat percentage you have. And then the last one that I have shown up there is lying down. And those are usually done in health, fit or health fitness centers or in doctor's offices. But what they do is they'll put electrodes on your arm and on your leg. And then the same thing. It sends an electrical current through your body and it estimates your body fat percentage. So 
So does anyone have any questions for me about BIA monitors? Yes. Um, they're fairly accurate. There's better measures to test your body fat percentage. Uh, there's what's called a bod pod or hydrostatic weighing. Those are better measures, but this is a simple way and it's very convenient for us to do. So, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. Hi folks, how are we doing today? Uh, today I'll be, my name is Jason Randolph. And I'll be working on mobile exercise apps. First app we have today is a seven minute workout challenge. With this, it is the number one selling app on iTunes and it has been researched on by the ACSM, so the American College of Sports Medicine and the New York Times. So what makes this such an appealing app to people? Well, what this is, a group of researchers have found 12 exercises that they, that they, uh, they have people perform for 30 seconds. They have a 10 second rest interval in between that. And what they found is that with the high intensity exercise with a short rest period, it creates a higher metabolism. And this can result to seven minutes being about the equivalency of an hour long. So what you're able to do is you're in seven minutes, you're able to get an hour long of working out. And there's no equipment necessary for this. And you can do it anytime, any place, anywhere. So with this app, there is no excuse, you know, oh, I don't have this equipment, you know, I don't have enough time. It's seven minutes and you need no equipment. The next app we have is the MyFit Fitness work, Workout Tracker and Weight Loss Exercise Log. With this, I found this one to be very interesting. It took a little time to find it, but it has, as you can see, just everything you could possibly think of. It is developed by a group of professional personal trainers, and with this, is they've created a group of workouts. You have your own certain programs. They have some specific regiments for, let's say you want to gain muscle, you want to lose weight, you want to work on your cardio. With this, it has three different inter intensity tra intervals. Beginner, intermediate, and advanced. With beginner, you just, you know, you work your way up, and then you hit intermediate, and then you work your way up to advanced. The other cool part about this is, in this picture down here in the bottom, is if you want to work out, let's say you want to work out your chest, you click on just the chest muscle, it'll give you a full list of exercises. There are over 2,000 exercises in this program. And say you click on one, you have no clue what that exercise is. It'll show you how to, a little animation of the exercise itself, and then a step-by-step -step process to do that exercise. And the cost with this, exercise, with this app is it's free. This is a free app that you can use, and it gives you all the programs and exercises you could even possibly think of. Any questions? What the res there was, they did a big research study on it through the ACSM, and what they found is with such high intensity exercise, I mean, you're that, that 30 seconds you are doing the exercise the whole time, and your rest period of 10 seconds it gets your body working out so fast that it does work. They found all the results that they found in the study that I looked at, everybody had increased, you know, increased muscle mass, all that, everything was increased. So it does work. That was $1.99, so $2 for, and everything is included with that. For the, sec for the second one, you can get the pro part. The basic was free. The pro is you get a little bit more, a couple more workouts in it, and that's $4. So $2 or $4 for just about anything you could possibly use. Turn over the commercial. Hello, um, I'm Marshall Creed. And I'm going to talk about the new trends in exercise. And the one I'm going to focus on is CrossFit. For anyone that knows me, this is kind of right up my alley. So. Um, and it kind of relates to what Jason was saying about the seven minute app. This kind of incorporates um, that high intensity um, portion of exercise as we will get into. Um, can you play the video? It's exciting. It's something that every day I can get a little creative with. I'm in the best shape of my life. I love coming here. I love the competition. I 
can do things I never thought I could do, like throw 100 pounds over my head. I don't see myself doing anything else if it's not CrossFit. This is definitely CrossFit, and this is, I love that stuff. Makes you walk taller, your mind is strong, your body's strong, and that just is the whole package. Find a CrossFit gym near you. Okay, um, as you can tell in that video, um, CrossFit's kind of a new thing and it incorporates many different age groups. Um, there's, in that video, there's an elderly man talking about how it's changed his life and then it, there was a younger lady who was in their mid-20s talking about how it's changed her life. And so pretty much CrossFit is just a high intensity functional movement. It talks about, um, it incorporates Olympic lifting, powerlifting, and gymnastics. Uh, the Olympic lifting portions are the clean and jerk and snatch. Uh, the power lifting, um, it consists of bench press, squat, deadlift. And the gymnastics are your handstand push-ups, pull-ups, uh, anything to do with a ring, ring muscle-ups, bar muscle-ups. And, it, and it, like I said earlier, it can be performed by all ages. And it incorporates all uh, health-related fitness components. So from flexibility to power to strength to agility, it incorporates all that and puts it into one little package. Um, the application of CrossFit, there's a little quote up there, and pretty much it just says that it can be scaled for any, uh, anyone's skill level. If you can't do a pull-up that week, the CrossFit gym will and the trainers will adapt to your needs and skill levels. And as I said earlier, age is a big part of CrossFit and exercise. If you're 12 years old and you're going to a CrossFit gym, they're not going to make you do lift over your own body weight. So it's really adaptable. And it's known as a sport of fitness. Um, it holds the CrossFit Games every year and to claim the fittest man and female. The way CrossFit workouts are um, scored, it's about how fast you can perform a, a workout in an amount of time or amount of rounds for time. And do you have any questions? CrossFit. CrossFit. Like in one word? Um, awesome. <laughs> CrossFit is like high intensity. Um, it involves the whole body, from flexibility to powerlifting. Yes, it's a series of exercises. You would come in, like you could do like three rounds of, say, three rounds of squats, uh, five squats, and five pull-ups for three rounds, and then you would do that. The Forging Elite Fitness, like I said, it incorporates all 10 fitness components. So it's looking at cardiovascular, your flexibility, power, balance, agility, coordination. So it involves all that and puts it into one. Um, it's just a, it's a new way of exercising pretty much. If it's done properly, yes. Um, if you go into a gym that's not done properly, then I would say no. And that can, that is like looked at. CrossFit does have a bad name because of CrossFit gyms who don't uh, preach technique and they just teach weight. And that's one reason why technique or CrossFit has a bad name. But if you go into a gym that doesn't just force weight upon you and actually teaches the technique and does hands-on experience, then The one of the ladies in Camille LeBlanc Bazant does eighty her max is eighty eight. Unbroken. So that's a Yeah. Well you can like I said, you can scale the workouts. So if you can't do if the workout calls for a hundred pull ups, then you could do and you can't do one pull up, well then you could do fifty and you could use a band. Or do jumping pull ups. There's always something for it. Anyone else? No? And then the local CrossFit gyms here in Charleston, Illinois. So.
Well, once again, thank you all for coming. My name is Tyler Mink, and I'm going to talk about video gaming and exercise. Now, when I say the word video games, a lot of you might think of someone sitting in the room in the dark with a headset playing Call of Duty. For some of you, it might, uh, you might think of someone in their living room with a joystick playing Pong on Atari. But one thing that probably doesn't come to your mind is physical activity with exercise, or physical activity with, with gaming. Um, it's one of the new things with modern technology, we're actually able to incorporate video gaming with exercise. And the first thing I'm going to show you is a couple of modern examples of it. We have the Nintendo Wii. Now, they incorporate all things from balance to yoga. You can do push-ups on their mat. You can do a, no a number of different exercises. And if you don't have Wii Fit, they have numerous other exercises, such as rowing. You can simulate rowing. And you can do numerous other activities. But the one thing is it increases your heart rate more than sitting in a chair. Another example we have is the Xbox Kinect. Now, one different thing about the Kinect as opposed to the Nintendo Wii is that you don't necessarily have to have a handheld controller. Uh, you can stand in front of the device, and it will scan your body. And from that point forward, your movement is uh, your, what the, you do, the character does on the screen. Which you can see here, they're playing volleyball. And uh, you can get some high-intensity workouts just from messing around and playing with these games. So what does that mean, though? How can it be utilized as a form of exercise? Well, presently, one of the biggest problems facing not only America but over the world is childhood obesity. With childhood obesity comes diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, which is high blood pressure. And what we're finding out is more and more people are incorporating devices like the Nintendo Wii into PE programs and after school programs. Here you see a class full of kids playing Dance Dance Revolution. All right? If we can disguise exercise as a video game, children will be more apt to uh, be included or feel like they want to participate. Also, a common phenomenon we're seeing, I worked in a cardiac re rehabilitation clinic where we instituted a Wii fitness program. And when you input the data, you can make a profile for each person. You can actually track their progress as they move along through the program. Now, one of the common th uh, difficulties we face is getting the elderly people to participate because they're scared and, quite honestly, they don't want to play a video game. But as we look to the future, what we're going to find is 50 years from now, the elderly people are going to be youth that grew up playing video games. So as fitness professionals and as technological experts, we're going to have to uh, be smart about how we're thinking about programs in the future. Because in 70 years, a person that grew up playing video games is going to want to play video games when they're older. That seems silly to think about because the people that are older now, they didn't have that, but we do. So if I'm an older adult in the future, am I going to want to play something like this as opposed to maybe just walk on a treadmill? No. So that's all I have for you. Do I have any questions? No? Perfect. All right, hey everybody, I am Michael Bauer, and I'm going to be talking about minimalistic running shoes. Now, everybody else has been kind of talking about new technology, and I'm kind of the caveman of the bunch, and I'm talking about new technology that was founded many years ago that we are revamping and changing how we do things. So first of all, you may say, you may say, what is a minimalistic running shoe? Well, on the screen, I have a couple examples. And on the table, I have a couple of the older versions of the examples because I am a poor college student. But a minimalistic running shoe is a running shoe that has very little support and very little just anything in the shoe. As Tyler is going to show, you can pick up that shoe and bend it and move it in any way you want. And the thought of this will go into our claims of it. And they claim that they can improve your running times. You can run farther and you can run faster. You can create a greater amount of force in your foot strike. These shoes also, they say, will decrease the amount of injuries you have. And they go by the less is more principle that we're hearing about more and more nowadays. So let's look at these claims, they say. Well, do they actually work? Well, in this graph, we can look at Closest to me in the picture, we have a boy running in tennis shoes, and on the far picture, he's running barefoot. And you can see this, these diagrams show the force that is being produced and the time. The one where he's running in a shoe, his force has a hitch in it where his heel is striking the ground, and then it goes into flow to create more force. 
where in the one where he's running barefoot, that force goes straight up and straight down, nice and smoothly. But the peak force really doesn't, you can't really see much difference in the peak force that is generated. These pictures kind of show the difference between a heel strike and a forefoot strike. In this picture on your left, a, we are, the person is performing a heel strike, so their heel is hitting the ground, and then as they roll up onto their toes, they're then pushing off, as opposed to the same, or the picture on the left, or my left, your right, where they are pushing off on their toes. And again, the diagrams kind of show that hitch in the force, and really the only difference is as you heel strike or run in a normal running shoe we have nowadays, it takes longer to get that force. What this is going to show is kind of the claim on injury prevention. When you're doing a heel strike running form that most running shoes nowadays have, as you hit the f ground with your heel, all the force or the pounding that you have from running goes through your heel, into your ankle, through your tibia, into your knee, and in your hip. And that's where when runners say, I'm feeling that injury from all this pounding, that's what they're talking about. Whereas when you're running on more of a forefoot strike, or running, on, running in these minimalistic shoes, they say that force will be generated not only through the whole, your whole body, but it'll also be generated out because of how the foot is made. So really, it's not the shoe that you're running in. It's going to be how you are running. And you should, we want to look at more of a forefoot strike rather than a heel strike. But if you're used to running and you run in a heel strike, you should never wear a minimalistic running shoe because you're going to run in a heel strike and it's just going to cause more injuries and you're not going to run anymore and your exercise is going to go to the wayside. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Well, the injuries are coming from that force that is going through your body. So if you think about it, as I walk, if I'm going to walk in a minute, like I have the toe shoes on right now, if I walk heel to toe, that force goes into my heel and it's going into all of my joints. Whereas when I walk in the same shoe, I may have less support, but as I walk on my balls of my feet, that force is going behind me and up my whole body rather than staying in the main lower body chain. Yes, sir. The zero drop heels? Yeah, what uh, you're talking about is the zero drop. As you can tell, this is the original Nike Free. It's pretty old. But it's very straight from the toe to the heels. So what that's encouraging, when you have a normal running shoe or a dress shoe, it has a taller heel. So the first thing that you want to strike is with the heel. But with this shoe, as you walk, you're walking in more of this motion. So you don't want to, your heel doesn't feel weighted down. Does that answer your question? Whether I can say they know for sure, I can't quite tell you that. There have been numerous studies, because this is, this, is this is really big in the market right now, they're looking at it. I've seen studies that show running in, on a four-foot strike is more economical for runners, so you'll improve your running capabilities faster running four-foot than you would heel strike. But then there's also studies that show if you run heel strike, you're going to have greater increases in your running eco uh, economy. So. Right now, I think it's more depending on who you are and how you run. Um, I have to run in these shoes because I have uh, kind of messed up feet and extra bones in my feet. So when I wear a normal shoe, it's uncomfortable and I don't like it. And I was a swimmer and I was more used to walking around barefoot all the time. So my running, st my running style was more attuned to that barefoot running style where I'm more on, my t on the balls of my feet. So I, was, I grew up getting, being more used to that. So it's more... I think how you're growing up and what you're used to. Um, if you watch like a lot of the modern marathons, the fastest marathon runners now are the Kenyans. 
And one of the thoughts on that is most of these athletes, when they're younger, they're running barefoot. And they, are t they naturally start that barefoot running style, and then they go with the more newer modern shoes with all the cushioning, but they still keep their running style. Yes, ma'am. Um, it makes a big difference. Um, if you are looking at going to minimalistic shoes, the number one, th one thing you want to think of is your arch strength. And when I did it, I, I went and did a whole lot of arch strengthening, calf strengthening prior to starting a lot of running in them and worked on my arch flexibility. And that's one problem a lot of people have. They go and say, oh, I saw those toe shoes. This guy said they're the greatest thing in the world. I'm going to go out and run 10 miles in them. Well, they run 10 miles in them, and they may, be, they may do good for about five miles, but I can attest to it because I tried it. About eight miles in, your feet start to get really tired, and you're like, I'm just going to start slapping at the ground, and you go to a heel strike or just a full slap, and you can just feel all that pain going in your foot. So it's more how you prepare for it. Anything else? All right, thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel McGrath, and tonight I'm here to talk to you about two fitness monitors which have been used to both track and motivate physical activity throughout different populations. First, we have the pedometer. This is a relatively inexpensive device used to track the number of steps taken. It uses a horizontal spring pendulum which moves up and down with each step you take and a pedometer reading of about 10,000 steps meets the daily requirement of 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity for adults. Some pedometers will estimate caloric expenditure and the distance traveled, but with these devices, the most accurate reading you'll get is the number of steps accumulated throughout the day. Next, we have accelerometers. Although these are more expensive, they are able to measure and store information based on intensity, frequency, pattern, and duration of activity throughout the day. These devices have internal clocks which are able to track your activity minute by minute. And by hooking this device up to a computer, you can view your intensity levels throughout the day and see exactly when you were most active or most intense during the day. Uh, these devices have gained a lot of attention over the past decade and they are very good at supplying us with a, an objective measurement of exercise which helps with both compliance and motivation. Any questions? Okay. All right, guys, I'm Lauren Jacobs. I'm going to talk to you about another mobile app. It's a running app. It's called Map My Run. This app is for the avid runner, someone who wants to run marathons, half marathons, etc. This is also for the casual runner, someone who just likes to run for recreational purposes or just to stay in shape. This can also be for you guys who have never run before. Maybe you get this app, it looks fun and exciting, and you want to go on a run. This is the number one running app on the iStore. It's also available for Android and Blackberry, as well as the iPhone. And this app has a lot of really neat features. First, route tracking. This app uses the GPS already built into your phone to track your route. You can run wherever you want. You're going to know exactly where you ran when you get back because it's going to be on your phone. If you like your route, you can repeat the route, you can change your route, etc. It also records how long you ran, how fast you ran. It calculates a pace at which you ran. It counts calories burned, it tracks elevation. This app does everything. 
site integration. Tyler came to me earlier this evening and he said, hey, Lauren, I haven't upgraded to a smartphone yet, so how am I going to use this application? You know, it sounds pretty cool. I said, well, Tyler, there's a website called Map My Run. You can go on to Map My Run, track your route on the website instead of on your phone. You can set goals, track your goals, track your progress, see how well you're doing. Challenge friends over here with social networking. You can run. Show a friend on Facebook or Twitter where you ran. Show them your track. Show them how many calories you burned, how fast you ran, etc. Post it on Twitter. Tweet about it. Email it to a friend. You can do all this stuff. This, this app is really cool, and the coolest part about it is it's free. It doesn't cost any money. It's not $1.99. It's, it's absolutely free. So go out there and start running. Download Map My Run. And do you guys have any questions? Absolutely. I mean, if you want to, say, jog at a very slow pace or walk, you can absolutely do that, and you, it'll still track you. I mean, you don't have to run for it to track where you go. You could bike. You don't have to run. It's, it's marketed towards runners. But, again, like you said, you could walk, bike, etc. It, it depends on your intensity. It depends on how fast you walk, on how fast you run. You could, you know, run at a, a very fast pace, and it, it, all, it depends on a lot of different variables. There's no one equation to say walking for five minutes equates to 20 minutes of running. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions?